Hi, Peter Caldas here. On this season of Future Proof, we're on the frontier of connectivity and aging. As we head into the winter months, which typically show increased social isolation and loneliness, this year brings special concerns as we continue to be forced apart due to the pandemic. This month's Future Proof, an ASA studio production, looks at the amazing technological innovations that could change the way people come together. Join us each week of November as we interview innovators and experts in aging who have big stories to tell. Hi, it's Peter Kaltz again with another episode of Future Proof. Today on Future Proof, I'm speaking with Sherry Rose, who is the CEO and Executive Director of the Thrive Center. It's a nonprofit innovation center focused on wellness and aging. She's also a partner at Commonwealth Leverage, a healthcare consulting firm. She was named by Louisville Business First as top 20 people to know in aging and was recognized by Health Tech Magazine as one of the three women to know in health IT. Sherry, welcome to Future Proof. Thank you. Glad to be here. So today, Sherry, I want to talk to you about how the Thrive Center is working to keep older adults connected, particularly now as we're in sort of the holiday season. We know social isolation and depression are on the rise in older adults, particularly due to COVID restrictions, but social isolation was nothing new before the pandemic. So I'm wondering if we could just spend some time today talking about the Thrive Center and some specific technology solutions. Sure. You know, the pandemic, uh, it's like, wow, 2020 hit. And this pandemic has just altered the way all of us are living today. And, you know, the comment that you made, Peter, on uh, loneliness and isolation isn't new. And it's not new. But I think what happened with the pandemic is it pushed it to the forefront. Uh, To now, we're looking at people in congregate living specifically um, that are in rooms. uh, They can't even do dining uh, together. Uh, You know, now is um, it's even increasing more the risk of spread. Um, they have decided that um, we're probably going to be isolated and on lockdown again. Who knows when that may happen? But it's become incumbent upon us that we've got to take care of uh, our aging adults who uh, are isolated in congregate living and at home. It's no different at home. And uh, so we're looking at all types of technologies that we've always had here in the Thrive Center. Um, and we created the Thrive Center because it is that immersive experience where you can come and feel and touch. That's but, yeah, that's what I was hoping we could we get started on because I'm not so sure many of our ASA members are familiar with the Thrive Center or the Thrive Alliance. Could you just let's start there? Let's start at that okay. at, the, the, at the top there. Sure. So when we created the uh, Innovation Center, we wanted it to be an immersive experience. We didn't want it to be a trade show floor. Uh, Most of my career I had spent on trade show floors uh, as a consultant, uh, you know, as uh, an employee of Bell South, AT&T, always looking at networking. And and I I quickly learned that a lot of times on a trade show floor, you'll see a product that you can't really drill down and get the feeling of how it really works in an enterprise or maybe even in your home. And so when we created the Thrive Center, we said we wanted that experiential center where that person can come through, be it a provider out in the industry uh, or one of their residents or someone at home who's providing care to an aging parent or that aging parent to come in and think, oh, wow, these are technologies I could use. They get to touch it, feel it, and experience it. Um, And so, you know, there are various technologies in here from the positive science um, brain where you can go and do um, speed of processing. Uh, We put it on a 55 inch rather than a tablet so they can walk up to it and play with it. Um, Focal point um, of the Thrive Center is our smart home. And we have architects who come in now and they look at, you know, how do we design for the future? We call it human centered design. but Simple things um, that maybe people don't think of, uh, but an induction cooktop. Um, And why is that important? You don't have to worry about someone burning themselves, touching it. 
Uh, if you leave a pan on the stove and you remove it and then you leave the stove on, that induction will turn it off. Uh, smart refrigerators, uh, a smart mirror that can, um, you can put um, medication reminders on there, the weather outside, scroll maybe a CNN update. There are so many technologies in the home. And so we designed it and created it where they can walk into the home and think, gosh, this could be my smart apartment. Uh, from That's great. Because it's really hands-on and practical, right? It's really about seeing themselves use this technology that's geared towards, towards them. And I'm wondering, these kinds of experiences, how are they impacted by COVID? And how did you have to pivot during the pandemic? Yeah, I mean, that was interesting because uh, we were, um, so I'll tell you a little bit of what we do with the technologies. We build programs around them. That's how we drive adoption. That's also how we get uh, community members engaged in what these technologies can do for them. Um, so I'll give you an example. One was our Strive to Thrive program uh, around mobility. Um, we use a technology here called Virtue, Virtue Balance. And we can do gait and balance assessments. And we have partnered with a university here in town. And their PT doctoral students train here. We're a service learning center. We bring individuals from the community in. We identify them if they're a fall risk. And then we enter them into that program. Um, and when the pandemic hit, we had to stop midstream. So students were sent home. We all remember those days. It's just like everything started shutting down, one thing right after the other. And um, so when the students came back on campus here this semester, uh, Dr. Quinn with Bellarmine University called and said, I don't want to be greedy, but I can't get my students into hospitals or in any of the senior living communities, and they need that hands-on training. She said, what do you think about bringing them in and continuing with uh, Strive to Thrive? And my comment to her was, I think we can have people at home, uh, lonely and isolated, and declining. Not only physically, but cognitively declining. And if they're not getting out and they're not getting that exercises, uh, exercise and muscles are uh, starting to atrophy, it's more important for us to bring them in and take precaution with masks and sanitizing and social distancing to work with those students. And, um, but we scaled it back where we would normally in a semester have 14 to 15. We have uh, three people in here twice a week and those students are learning from them and uh, they're getting the benefit of teaching core body strength and gait and balance. And so it's, um, and they wanted to come back. Um, chair yoga, we had to eliminate that. Uh, we were in the middle of a National Institute on Aging bingo size study, and we had to stop midstream of that. Well, you know, when you're into a research study, uh, what happened is um, we invalidated the study. At some point, we may pick back up on it, but they did agree to pay those um, community members who were coming in and were a part of that study. Um, but on the chair yoga, uh, these older adults called us and said, could we please come in? We're tired of being cooped up in our house. And so we said, sure, we'll social distance. We have uh, Theora Clear. It's technology that's uh, a touchless body temperature scanner here. So it comes in, it reads your eyes and your forehead. It asks you the CDC questions and it prints out a perforated badge just to tell you you passed. And so we do take precautions, but they come in two days a week and uh, they're getting uh, the chair yoga exercises. So it's these older adults that are reaching out to us. Right. No. And, and it's great that you've been flexible and nimble to provide as much of your services during the pandemic as possible. I want to focus on on two services, though, that are uh, that seem to strengthen connectivity. One um, relates to writing. Um, mm -hmm. specifically, I think it's called Feet to the Fire workshops. Could you talk a little yeah. bit about that? Sure. Um, we actually um, had sessions in here early on. We partnered with uh, Louisville's Fund for the Arts, and we did two six-week sessions. One was actually on a Saturday. One was during the week. And then we did an open mic where they were able to tell their stories, and we invited the public and families to come in and hear those stories. 
that was in person. And Fun for the Arts, uh, they actually sponsored that. Um, but what's happening now with those writers workshops is it has to be done virtually uh, because you can't do the in-person uh, where you have a lot of them in there. So they can use uh, Zoom um, just like we're doing now. And so um, Angela, who is the founder of Feed to the Fire, she also goes in and she will train a lot of the life enrichment directors on how to conduct that and give them a kit. So it's a train the trainer program. But the stories that we have gotten, it's been invaluable for these older adults to tell stories as they were growing up. And uh, it's just with a prompt and they just start to write. And, um, you know, to see a family sitting in there when we had the open mic session and it's like, well, we never knew that. We never heard that before. But, you know, the VA came in here and they said, we're always trying to capture the stories of our veterans. And this is a perfect um, solution to uh, doing that. Uh, so it's kind of it's leaving a legacy. What a, what a wonderful way also to promote creative writing at, at any age and to promote that kind of shared experience. I think that's a wonderful resource to reduce social isolation. Let's talk, let's talk a little bit about uh, um, sort of on the opposite end of the, of the spectrum, a real sort of uh, technology-based solution, and that is your use of VR. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I know you, you have some, some tools there, and I, I was hoping you could talk about them. We have lots of tools. You know, I taught a gerontology class this morning, and uh, I, we had to do it remote because their students were also remote. And I said it was interesting. I felt like Vanna White in there pulling all of my toys out. But uh, we have a lot of VR in here. So let, let's talk about the difference of what we can do with virtual reality. One um, is a virtual reality called Neuro Rehab VR. And that's where take someone who uh, maybe range of motion or balance and you put them into VR where they're not walking uh, this line or doing an exercise. It's very socially engaging as well as therapeutic. They may be uh, pushing a grocery cart down an aisle and reaching for a can on a shelf. They may be on a soccer field and you're collecting data with a device that fits to the ankle as they're kicking um, a soccer ball across the field. Um, it could be a, a Jedi, and uh, we've got hand devices where maybe they're with it's a laser and they're slicing at things coming at them. So it's very engaging. That works on gait and balance. A couple things we did uh, when the pandemic shut us down, we said these technologies should go out in the community. So we took uh, Rendever, which is a networked VR, and we sent it to Nazareth Homes here in town. And we said, let your residents use this. The videos that came back were amazing. They were in these videos, they were traveling together, like you and I could be in Rendever and we could be scuba diving together and we could have a conversation about it. Uh, We could be on the streets of Rome and we could be talking about what we were seeing. And so we captured a lot of videos and uh, pictures from these residents talking about it. They didn't feel the loneliness and isolation. They were actually traveling. Um, Another interesting story that happened um, in the spring, right when the pandemic hit, um, we know what VR does with anxiety. And so we use it a lot to reduce anxiety. Actually, NIA, National Institute on Aging, looks at virtual reality, uh, anything that would get people off of opiates, um, where they go into surgery, can you reduce anxiety to get them off of pain meds? And so they're doing a lot of studies around that. But we had a family here in town call us. They had a four-year-old son who had stepped on some burning embers in the backyard from a bonfire they had had the night before. He was being uh, released from the hospital, badly, badly burned his feet. And um, they said, um, you know, could we use the VR? So we sent applied VR to their house. The father that night um, sent us a, um, a bit, it was a picture of the little boy sitting in a tub with the VR on. I mean, it was the cutest picture. His mouth is open. He was playing bear blast. And uh, he said, we've had to hold him down to change his dressings and uh, bathe his feet. And he didn't even know we did it. 
And so the father was choked up. It's like, this has really been a, a lifesaver for us. Uh, and, but it was so engaging for him. He didn't care. He was playing bear blast. And then the other VR that we use in here is uh, Embodied Labs. And we use that as a training tool. Um, we have three stations in here where we invite, uh, you know, it could be a provider, uh, an administrator of some of our senior living communities. We hosted uh, uh, the American College of Healthcare Administrators, and they went through that program. And you can embody a person called Beatrice who has Alzheimer's disease. You see what she sees, you hear what she hears, and you you get to you get the feeling uh, of what it's like to have Alzheimer's. Uh, it talks about the brain and what's happening in the brain. Um, you know, we've done Lewy body syndrome associated with Parkinson's in here. I actually had someone come to me and we had a third grade class in here and uh, they had a project for the year on aging. And so I thought, well, this is really going to be different. I deal with uh, providers and older adults, but uh, I had a whole third grade class and we put a little girl into uh, Lewy body syndrome. And these kids, we projected it on the screen in our event space, and these kids were mesmerized. But, uh, and then we were able to talk to them about, you know, to her, those fireflies were real. Uh, so if you're talking to your grandparents, and, you know, maybe they're seeing something, and this was around the holidays, uh, we said if they're seeing something that maybe isn't there, it's real to them. You may not see it, but it's real to them. And so we have a way. Uh, with virtual reality and what we do here to um, educate the public on uh, what it's like. Yeah. And it's, and it's amazing. I mean, I, I would love to see some of those videos. I think those are, those are really remarkable uh, evidence of how effective these new technologies are. I want to step back for a minute. You, we, in your discussion, you've sort of shared with us a variety of technologies and a, a variety of products that, that are featured at the Thrive Center just generally speaking, from the manufacturers and the producers and the startups that you work with, what do folks get right in the design side of these technologies and these products? What do they get right? You know, we talk to so many entrepreneurs and we see so many products. Um, we don't show anything in here that's not commercially available, uh, but we talk to a lot of companies that are in prototypes. Um, we see a lot um, that could be in a saturated market, and we try and help them with that. It's like you have to differentiate yourself. And we also have to lead them down the path, and this is what the Thrive Alliance really does. So we have uh, provider members who are willing to be those first adopters or to pilot some of these solutions to say, this isn't the right market for us, or how am I going to pay for it? Um, you know, we always look at uh, in driving adoption, uh, you have to consider uh, training for that technology and you have to consider uh, affordability. Those people that get it right, take that into account. Uh, they have to know, is this something uh, that is either driving productivity within that uh, provider's uh, industry uh, or is it reimbursable? And, um, you know, social engagement is, is really critical, but uh, is it coming out of the marketing budget? You know, that's where we try to um, help them on. If, if you want to sell and you want to scale, then you have to take into account if you're living in their world. And especially today, as you know, uh, with the pandemic, uh, they're so focused on stopping the spread and they're not letting a lot of vendors come into uh, their communities it has to uh, really be around COVID on stopping the spread or really driving that productivity. Uh, they have a need to have their staff focused on caregiving um, and not training and other things. So those that get it right have to take that into account. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Uh, take into the, the account the, of the user experience, probably the family members, the caregivers as well. Um, that's, that's really great to hear. And, um, you know, I... I can appreciate that it's been difficult for probably these manufacturers as well during the pandemic, but I'm, I want to sort of turn to sort of one last question, uh, mm -hmm. and that is about the future. You know, we're particularly optimistic that this pandemic has sort of highlighted the worst things related to aging that we can 
account for and, and probably uh, fix moving forward. From your perspective, what are some new technologies that you're excited about for the future and maybe some that are specific to reducing social isolation? You know, there are a lot of social engagement tools that are out there. Um, but I think where we have to go, and, you know, I always look at 70 million baby boomers um, who we were around when the internet was introduced. Technology is not new to us. Um, if you're a provider, you have to be prepared for us coming into your community with our smart watch, our smart tablet, our Alexa device, uh, our smart remote TV operator, all the things that uh, we have in our homes today. Uh, but what I also realize is many of us will be aging at home, and that's where we want to be. So when I look at uh, the future of technologies, uh, it's going to be the home. And it's going to be people who will be aging at home. And how can we allow them to age independently through remote monitoring? You know, now we look at ambient sensors because, you know, when you think about dementia, um, and I've talked to entrepreneurs that'll say, well, we can put a wearable on them and we can lock it down. They won't get it off. And, you know, I cared for a mother with Alzheimer's and I lost my mother to Alzheimer's disease. And I said, I have to tell you, the day will come, they're not going to have that on their wrist. We have to look at uh, these ambient sensors that can detect motion and activity in the home, uh, that can detect maybe a fall, someone's on the floor. And um, now CMS, what excites me is CMS is actually reimbursing now on some of the wearables and uh, remote technologies. I've seen this. I've had a few people contact me with, with uh, the CARES Act money to uh, say, hey, can we, um, who would you recommend as far as wearables? Because you don't want that chronically ill person coming into your clinic when you can monitor them remotely through the cloud. And, um, you know, from pulse ox to blood pressure to a scale for somebody with chronic heart disease and uh, tracking water retention to even someone uh, on glucose levels who, um, with dementia, they don't remember to check their blood sugar. Um, and it can alert someone that uh, they need to give themselves insulin. Those are the types of things um, that we're seeing. I think it's important with technology that we integrate it. We find a way to integrate it into the day-to-day -day life of that individual. So to take those vitals and to put it on a tablet, like the Breezy tablet uh, that's out there, Vital Tech acquired them. Those guys met here at the Thrive Center, and Vital Tech, who does remote monitoring, acquired the Breezy tablet. And that's what they're going to do is to integrate that. I think we, so those things excite me for the future, but I think where we have to go, Peter, is um, we have to get the payers to start paying for those uh, types of devices. That's going to be key to helping our aging population to age well at home and keep them out of the hospital. I think that's a, that's a great point to end on because at the end of the day, um, you know, there's gotta be a demand for this and for these companies to be successful, they have to make a profit. And if no one's paying for them, then these devices will disappear from the market. It's a very simple, simple formula. Oh. But I appreciate which, how, how, you're, how you're ending that point. It's a very important point. But um, Sherry, thank you so much for joining us. I, we could spend Absolutely. hours talking about all the amazing innovations that you're featuring uh, at the Thrive Center that you're the CEO and executive director of. And I hope we can, we can at some future ASA event. Uh, absolutely. would love to. And we invite you. Check out our website. Uh, you'll see our uh, mission and our pillars. Um, and that's um, thrivecenterky.org. And uh, it's, we've redesigned it recently. So it really uh, lays out uh, what the Thrive Center is uh, about in our mission. Terrific. Well, thank you again, Sherry. And thank you for watching this episode of Future Proof. Hi, I'm Jen Rivera, ASA's Membership Engagement Manager. I want to invite you to our upcoming Generations Forum, December 7th through the 11th. We will meet all week in fun, educational, and interactive virtual experiences that will last up to one hour per day as we work together to tackle the digital divide. 
Join us as we define the digital divide in broadly and we get tactical on solutions that we can all take, exploring ideas with aging and tech experts, the leaders in their fields. Register today and learn more at www.asaging.org.